Good morning. morning. Happy Halloween to y'all. I see everyone wore costumes. Oh, hold on, wait. Some of you aren't. I can't really tell. Good to see y'all this morning. And and for those of you who who dressed up in the festive spirit of Halloween with your costumes, it's good to see y'all on display. Who's excited about this evening? coming out this evening. We've got quite a, quite a bit planned, and we hope that you'll come and, and be part of it. Um, you don't have to be super young to, be, to come and be part of it and have a good, a good time. But I um, want to welcome those who, who are here for worship, those who are joining us online. We are glad that you're uh, joining us this morning for this time set aside to worship God. I want to welcome those who are visiting us. We are so glad that you're here as well. Uh, you'll notice that if you've got a bulletin, part of that tears out. The, the side that says, thank you for being our guest today. If you're visiting, please leave us some information so we can follow up and see how we might be able to connect with you and your family and, and, and possibly provide some ministry uh, there to you. We would love uh, to be able to do that. I want to remind you this morning for giving of tithes and offerings. You can do so with uh, the offering plates that are located here at the front of the sanctuary and also um, at the back as you uh, exit out the back towards Wilson Street. Um, we're not taking up offerings, passing the plate right now, but you can give uh, in those locations. Uh, you can also give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org, or you can uh, mail or drop off uh, tithes and offerings during the week. That's also the place, if, if you're a visitor and fill one of these out, you can place uh, those in the offering plates, and uh, we'll, we'll get those and follow up with you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have our fall festival this afternoon. That's our, uh, that, so the Fall Festival and Trunk or Treat are two different events that are both happening here. Uh, one from four to six, which is the Fall Festival. That's rescheduled from a few weeks ago when we had a, a really rainy Sunday. Um, but uh, the details you need to know uh, for that is that the youth are putting that on. Um, that is going to be to raise uh, or to collect clothing items that are gently used for children, uh, both boys and girls, all ages, and even adults' uh, sizes uh, for girls, uh, women, and men's. Um, you can bring those gently used clothes items this evening, but the entry to get into the fall festival is canned food. So grab some canned food out of your pantry or uh, swing by the food line uh, or the pig and pick up a little bit, of, a few cans, and, and come on and have a good time from 4 to 6 p.m. Again, the youth group will be putting that on. Then from 6 to 8 p.m., we have our trunk or treat that will be um, here at the back. And so I'm going to call on Holly now. She's going to share a few things that are still needed and details about that. Good morning. Thank you, Holly. And thank you for, for those, of you who, those of you who've already signed up. And once again, there's still a need. And we thank you for those who will be able to help in answering that need uh, this evening. Um, I want to share with you that next Sunday, uh, we will have our All Saints recognition. And so uh, we've decided since 2020 um, was a difficult year and, and there wasn't a, 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 an, an All Saints Sunday, we're going to do um, it a little bit differently this year. We're going to... Um, we're going to remember those who were members of our church who've passed since November 1st of 2019 next Sunday. So if that's a, a, one of those people is a family member of yours, we want to let, make sure that you know and that you could let uh, your family know. Um, we're going to have some candles here on the altar table and we will light a candle um, in memory of each person who passed who was a member of the church. We'll also have an additional candle uh, that will represent people, uh, you know, f- for all of us who are close that we've lost in the past two years. And so we hope that you'll uh, come and, and be part uh, of that. Um, and, and it's, an, it's an important part of our journey together um, that we remember those um, who have gone on before us. And so we will do that next uh, Sunday during our worship service. also want to remind you that Daylight Savings Time ends next weekend. So I don't know about you, but it's, gonna, it's confusing, right? It's, so you set your clock back 
an hour Saturday night before you go to bed. Just want to remind you, okay? Um, so I've said it, and if you don't, if you, I, I don't know. I, I just get confused every weekend that the time changes. So we'll try to be here, though, right? Sound good? All right. Um, I would last like to, uh, to welcome Casey Wortham this morning. Uh, Casey is going to be uh, our soloist during the choir anthem, and we want, want to speak a word of welcome uh, to you, um, and, and thank you for uh, sharing your gifts and talents this morning in worship with us. At this time, I invite you to join your hearts with me in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for the opportunity to set aside time to, to gather as your body, to gather as your family, and to worship you. We pray that as we do so, that we would encounter you in a very real way. We pray that you would challenge us this morning as we give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll be reading the gospel reading, which comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the man, to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, this morning, uh, as we have our pastoral prayer time, I want to direct your attention to our prayer list on the back. And uh, you'll see uh, uh, several of the people who are dealing with various things going on. I also want to mention this morning that uh, Linda Sitton's mother had an accident over the weekend and is going to be having surgery uh, following worship uh, early afternoon. So, uh, we want to keep her in our prayers uh, as well. What Can you remind me of her name? Christine Hewlett. Christine Hewlett. So we want to add her uh, uh, to that list, if you would, Christine Hewlett. Again, that's Linda Sitton's mother, and uh, she had a fall over the weekend, and uh, we want to pray for her as she has a surgery uh, this afternoon to, to do some repairs. I also want to remind you that um, at the, the end of each month, we are refreshing the prayer list um, just to kind of keep it current and, and know some information about who's on the list. So if you would like to remain on the list or a family member uh, would like to remain on the list, please contact the office um, by uh, this coming Wednesday to let us know, to, to add, to make sure they're on uh, the one that comes out for November 7th. This time I ask you to join your hearts with me in prayer. God, we again give you thanks for this time that we can gather together and worship you. God, we give you thanks for the ways that you have called us to be family together, to minister to one another, and to lift each other up in prayer. Lord, this morning we see our prayer list. We see the folks who have great need. We, we've mentioned Christine this morning who's having surgery following uh, this, this service time. And God, we pray for healing for these folks. We pray for your presence to be with them in, in very mighty and, and profound ways. 
We pray that your spirit would guide them and, and give them the peace that, that they so need in their lives. Again, we ask for healing and, and we ask for the answer to prayer. God, we pray that you would put them on our minds and on our hearts, that, 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 we, would, that, that we would feel the, the need to carry their burdens alongside of them. And in doing so, that you would show us how we can be your hands and feet in their lives. Lord, the truth is we all carry burdens every day and we're called in, in your word to, to, to lay those at your feet and, and, and to seek the kingdom of God and to take up our cross and to follow you and to allow you to take care of the rest. So that, that's an easy thing to understand, an easy thing to read, but it's a hard thing to do. Uh, but Lord, give us courage as, as we seek you and seek your kingdom and seek to be the people that you've called us to be, that we might bear fruit in, in doing those things. God, we thank you for our church. We thank you for the calling that we have to make disciples. And we thank you for events like the ones we're going to have this afternoon, the fall festival, to, to help do ministry for, for children and, and adults in our area, um, to, to, to get canned food to help meet some hunger needs and, and food needs in our area. And then the opportunity to, to have children and families come onto our property and to meet them and, and to smile at them and to give them some candy, but in doing so to, to plant seeds of relationship, Lord. And we pray that you would help us plant many seeds. We pray that you would help us um, uh, make, uh, make, meet many new people and, and, and in doing so that they would feel called to, to, to be part of what you're doing here. God, we thank you for the, the great narrative and the great story that you're writing with your people and that you are that you are choosing to write with First Baptist Church Farmville. So Lord, as we, uh, as we continue to worship you this morning and continue to, uh, to seek you, we again ask that you would reveal yourself to us and that you would draw us together and continue to help us to be the people you have indeed called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
The church I grew up in, First Baptist Church of Scotland Neck, North Carolina, didn't do trunk or treat. I, um, you, you know, that, that was back in the day when you went house to house. I don't know how it is in Farmville yet with the, leaving the porch light on and, and everything. I know we have the hometown Halloween and trunk or treat events happening at, at different places. But back in that day, we didn't have, you know, you get to come to, to the church and wear costumes and that sort of, sort of stuff, you know. But we did have a candy man. Uh, there was a man, his name was Mr. Mitchell, and um, he was an older gentleman, um, uh, had dark black hair, thick glasses, and always had a pocket full of Werther's Originals. Anybody grow up in the church like that, or maybe you're the candy man before COVID, because you know, now you can't hand the stuff out of your pocket to people but to, 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 to eat. Um, but yeah, we, we always, on Sunday mornings, we would look for Mr. Mitchell, and, and he, uh, when we would say, thank you, Mr. Mitchell, he said, no, I'm the candy man. But, um, yeah, it's a good, good memory. So I grew up in Scotland Neck, North Carolina, and, and the home that our family lived in, we moved into when I was about five years old. It was on, on Church Street, a few blocks um, from the church. I think I'm even, actually, we live closer to this church than our family did to the church that, that I grew up going to. Uh, so I've won up my, my mom and dad there just a little bit. Um, but we lived in, in this, this old house, a two-story house that uh, they had you know you could go up in the attic and it had those windows and we were always looking up there from the street especially this time of the year to see if there was any spooks and in, in, uh, you know up in the the attic moving around and um, it was a beautiful white two-story house that had these brick red shingles that matched the red brick um, that accented the house my family moved in there like I said when I was four or five years old and I remember my dad telling the story when we were young of when they first moved into the house and and it, the house was known as the Pittman House. Um, that's the family who had built it in Scotland Neck. And, and uh, when my family bought the house, um, there were some renovations and different things my dad had to do. Well, he tells a story of, of one day he was, he was working in the front, front part of the house in what was our living room and doing some finishing work on the baseboards that, that needed repair. And he heard someone come in the back of the house. And it, the way the house was situated... Um, you could look through the dining room into the kitchen, and in the kitchen there was a, a door that opened up uh, to, to come in that way. And he said he heard the door open, and he looked back, and there was a man there with a top hat and a trench coat. And, and he called to the man, and, 
He heard the man make some mumbles and then come, come like he was going to come down out, back out the door through a, a little sun porch that came down a corridor that circled back to the living room. He heard the footsteps, but he never saw anyone. And he said this didn't only happen once, but it happened many times um, in the course of doing the renovations and the work. But it was always when he was at the front of the house, and this happened at the back. And outside of the back of the house, there was a shed. Um, and, and the shed was the shed that, um, that came, came with the house. And it was one of those with the dirt floor, probably like a 25 by 25. And, and my dad would say when he went to inspect and he heard these sounds, a door had been opened and all the doors in the shed were open. Well, after our family moved in there, my dad was, um, we were at home one day, and my dad said that, that, uh, that a person came by and wanted to share some pictures of when our house was being built. And, and when the house was being built, when they looked at these pictures, you could see, you know, these were way back in the day, black and white photos. Um, you could see the, the different you know, people doing the different work. And always in the picture, there was a man with a black top hat and a trench coat. And my dad asked, who, who is that? Who is that person? And these folks who had been working on the house, who were teenagers in their early 20s at the time, who now were older, much older people, said, oh, that's Mr. Pittman. He, ins he, he inspected every aspect of the building of this house. And so it, it scared my dad a little bit, and of course, you know, um, that was something he told us, which scared us with regards to the house. Well, years and years passed, and uh, my, my family uh, became a foster family when I was about 9 or 10 years old. Um, my parents had me and my sister, and they decided to open our home to more children to help in the Halifax County area. And so we became a foster family, and uh, we soon adopted two little boys. And my youngest brother, Corey, um, had heard the stories about Mr. Pittman and um, about ha having possibly seen him in the back of the house. And uh, um, when Corey was reaching probably Luke's age, seven, eight, nine years old, we started having things happen around the house. Things were left open like they usually would be, but they would be shut, and then pretty soon after they would be back open, or things would be misplaced, or there was one place uh, that my mom had these little precious moments or precious memories dolls. Some of y'all had them probably in your house. Some of you may still have them, and they would rearrange themselves. Really weird stuff going on. Then my brother Corey started talking about the man in the top hat and the trench coat that he was seeing doing these things. Now, we didn't know whether to believe him or not because he'd heard the stories, but one day when he was at school, my, my dad had this lady. Uh, she, he was telling the story to this lady who was a member of our church named Miss Teeny. Miss Teeny was a prayer warrior, one of those people who loved to pray and anoint and just was a prayer warrior. Uh, I remember going by our house and uh, to ask for donations for different little things that we would do for youth group and, and, and church and, and other. And, and she would always donate, but then she'd say, let me give you the best gift. And she'd spend about 30 minutes praying for whatever it was we were doing, which were prayers that were surely answered. Well, Miss Teeny wanted to come by and kick Mr. Pittman out of our house. And so my dad let Miss Teeny come by one day while we were all at school. And she prayed over the house and prayed that he, he would leave. And so... My dad didn't see, he didn't want to freak us out, so we didn't find out about this until later. About a month had gone by, and my dad brought up Mr. Pittman. Oh, we hadn't seen Mr. Pittman lately, because it had kind of been a hush-hush, you know. We, um, Corey hadn't said anything about him. Well, we're at dinner table, and my dad's bringing it up, and all of a sudden, Corey starts crying. He's getting really upset, and my dad's trying to ask him what's going on. He won't, he won't say what's wrong. He just keeps crying and crying and crying. And finally, we get it out of him. And finally, we're sitting there at the table, and he said, I saw Mr. Pittman out in the shed, but he told me not to tell you because if, if you found out, you'd get that lady to come and kick him out of there too. <laughs> yeah. And several years after that, there was a, 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 an October fall afternoon, a Saturday afternoon that we were up working at the church. Saturday, living that close to the church, and my dad being a minister of music and being a, a, a type A personality, having to get everything exactly right before Sunday. We were up there. He was moving wires around, and I was helping him do it and everything. And we had a foster child at the time named Brandon, and he, he was about four or five years old. And he was back in, in uh, the, the little uh, uh, hallway area that, that was similar to this behind uh, the choir loft. And uh, we heard him talking. And the next thing we know, he came through the sliding door, 
And we could smell the Werther's original that he had in his mouth, sucking on that thing like a little four or five-year-old does. And we said, where did you get that? He said, I got it from the candy man, that big man with the glasses. My dad said, what? He said, yeah, the candy man. He said he's a candy man back there. He gave me this candy. He had big glasses on. Mr. Mitchell had died five years ago to that day. My dad liked to tell his ghost stories. And as his son, I like to tell his ghost stories. And the youth that I've served, they love hearing the ghost stories. But here's the thing that I've noticed about those stories. They get better and better every time he tells them. <laughs> and there are more details that are added to the stories after the first tellings. You know what I mean? I have no doubts that those stories are just that. They're stories. <laughs> they're stories he made up. And they're stories that are fun to tell and get some goosebumps. Um, Gina and I don't like having the kids sleep in the bed with us, so my kids haven't heard those stories, and hopefully they're not overhearing them right now. Um, but they're fun. They're fun to tell. They're fun to sit around a fire and, and tell, but I have no doubt that they are made up and that they are just stories. How many of us are perhaps telling ghost stories with our lives? Stories about our lives that, that affect the way we live Early on in my life, hearing those, those ghost stories, I was scared to death of the house that I lived in. I was scared to go up those steps. I was scared of all the little creaky sounds that that, that house made, even though it was just an old house still settling decades after decades after decades after it had been built. Those stories had a way of controlling me, controlling what I believed about reality or believed about what could be there. And I believe that as people who are following Jesus in life, that sometimes he's not the main story of our lives. I believe that sometimes we're writing these stories, and, and I like to call them ghost stories, that aren't real, yet they directly affect the way we live. I believe that, that we are called to live a life of purpose. I believe that we're called to, to allow God to, to, to write a beautiful story in our lives. Not an easy story, but a story that is true and that is honoring to God. A story that, that, that actually has power and meaning behind it. A story that is, that, that, that is one pastor who told me about a funeral he had just done for a man who honored God in every way in his life said, I didn't have to lie any during that funeral sermon. I think God is asking us to, to write wonderful stories. Beautiful stories. And this morning I want to direct us to a passage of scripture where God is described as a, as a story writer, as an author and perfecter of our faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, we're, we, 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 hear, we hear those words, we see those words written. Actually, I, was, I, I found in, in the, the new, new international version that I preach from that I've actually changed that word, and I'll go through the various meanings that the word means, but we do see that God is the one who begins and, and writes our story, our faith. So, I want to direct you this morning to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to go through verse 15. And before I do it, uh, I want to talk a little bit about stories. Who's ever written? We all went to school pretty much, right? Did you ever write a story? Did you ever, you ever remember learning the word plot? Plot? A plot? The plot is the direction of a story's main events and the purpose. Okay, I don't want to talk so much about the plot today. As we look in the Bible, we see that this is the plot in God's story, that he created man and woman in his image, that he put Adam and Eve in a garden where there was perfect relationship between God and between them. Yet they sinned. They missed the mark. They, they did exactly what God told them not to do, and the, 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 the direct effect of their sin was that they were exiled from the garden into a broken world. But we see that God again and again throughout the Old Testament is, is calling people to lead people towards holiness, toward a relationship with God. And it culminates with God coming in his very self, God in flesh as Jesus Christ. You, 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 you've heard me say it many times on the ultimate mission trip. You know, we think about going on mission trips and change, changing people or leading them and converting them to Jesus Christ, to Christianity. But it was God who went on the first mission trip, coming to this very earth in his flesh as the man Jesus to live a sinless life and to die a death that he didn't deserve so that we might have 
peace in our relationship with Him. And so when we, we, we put our faith in Jesus Christ, believing that He is who He says that He is, and that He died a, a, a death that He didn't deserve, a death that, that frees us from our sin, we are forgiven of our sin. But He didn't stop there. He, he gifted us the Holy Spirit that now leads us into living these eternal lives that we're promised that, 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 that not only begin when we die, but begin now. You remember the last three weeks we did the eternal living eternal life series. That's the plot. And one day God is going to complete it all. Evil is going to be completely destroyed. And he's going he, he's to renew the heavens he, and, 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 and the earth. And there, the, the Bible says a new heavens and a new earth. That all the, the, the evil stuff is going to be gone. And it's going to be complete relationship between us and God. As he meant it to be. We're basically going to go back to a Garden of Eden type scenario. Where that's that perfect relationship between us and between God. That's the plot. But in the midst of that, there are subplots. I think that we each are a subplot in God's grand design. And so as I read through this this morning, I want to, I want to, to, to teach this passage of Scripture in, in helping us understand that there are subplots that are in common in many of our stories, a lot of our stories that we see here illustrated in this great passage of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1. Through 15. And the first subplot is this. We are part of a bigger story. Okay? We're part of a bigger story. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So, this passage of Scripture, I think, begs the question, what is the writer of Hebrews talking about? Who are the great cloud of witnesses? And I've heard people throughout my history in, in, in following Jesus and hearing teachings uh, talk about people who die being able to look down upon us, to see us. Um, in my research on this one verse, it opened up a Pandora's box, so to speak. It's a good word for a Halloween, right? A Pandora's box of theological fault. And is it, is it actually healthy or not to think in these ways? That some people will take this verse and say, well, when a loved one passes, I'm able to pray to that person. Okay? The Bible doesn't say anything. It actually dissuades us from, from praying to dead people or talking, trying to seek people, dead people. There's, there's all these other... Um, you know, necromancy, all, all of these other places where the Bible prohibits that are kind of kind of stirred up and in, in, in within the realm that some people include in their Halloween celebrations and stuff. But but kind of the simple thing to say here is that the great cloud of witnesses that the writer of Hebrews is talking about is not just people that we know who are now sitting in a stadium looking down on us and cheering us on. It's it's very specific that that they're talking about people who've come before us and the example that they left. And, and, and this is the only place in all of Scripture that it talks about people who've passed being able to look down upon us. So I think there's some caution here. I think there's some caution here because I, I've, I've witnessed people who've, who've lost a loved one praying to God and very quickly in the midst of their prayer begin praying to their dead loved one. And that's a dangerous realm to get in. Every time in the scriptures that people tried to seek dead people, again, through these mediums and everything, it didn't go good. There's a place where Saul tried to do that. It didn't go, the witch of Endor, I don't know if y'all remember any of that. It's, it didn't go very well. It's, it's bad, it's bad stuff. When we pray, the only object of our prayer is to be God himself, and we pray through Jesus Christ because he intercedes for us. Amen, right? We're good, we're on the same page there. So what's he talking about? Who the, who, who's the great cloud of witnesses? You don't have this here, but I'm going I'm to read just the names that appear in chapter 11. As you remember, it's called, we call it the hall, the hall of, it's not the hall of fame, it's the hall of faith. All of these people who, who came before, uh, before Jesus, who walked in faith, who did great works, many of whom never even saw the effect of, of, of what their faith would, would bring about. And these are just the names. I've just highlighted the names, and I'm going to read a, a small part of that, but th these are just the names. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, Rahab. And then, and then I'm going to read verse 32 through 40 just so you can get more of a sense of who are these great cloud of witnesses? Who are these people that we actually fall into the narrative 
our stories fall into the narrative with them. In verse 32, the writer says, And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel. And then, and then he does. He says, In the prophets, through, uh, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised, uh, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us they would be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, these people who've come before us, who we hold up as these like Mount Rushmore of our faith that has more than what, four faces on it, lots and lots of faces of names in the Bible. Can, 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 can we believe just for a moment that, that while people might not write a book about us, that we're called to, to live our lives in such a way that we honor God the same way these people honor God and being obedient? God, God wrote stories, again, that weren't easy, and we read some hard things right there, but they were obedient. They followed God in their lives. And we're going to talk a little more about that. Subplot one, you're part of a bigger story. You're part of a bigger story. Subplot number two, your story is a redemption story that begins with Jesus. In verse two, he goes on, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Again, we have a, a author and per, anybody grow up with author and perfecter of our faith being in, in your Bible. I know I was when I went to read this, I was like, well, God, I'm already preaching on it. And they, it, the word's different, but pioneer, founder, author, all of those words translate from the same Greek word here where, where, where we're coming from. It's the, Jesus is the one who begins the story. So let me tell you this. You can, you can write a, a, a good worldly story without Jesus, but it's going to be just that. It's going to be worldly. It's not going to be the heroic story of really overcoming those hard things. You might be able to get a New York Times bestseller book out of you. But it's not going to be the story that, that lives on for eternity. There's going to come a day when those stories are put to the side for the main story. Amen? And I want to be a subplot in that story. I would much rather be a subplot in that story than, 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 than be the richest person in the world. Because how lonely must it be to be the richest person in the world who doesn't have to work for anything? Can you imagine Again, some of us are like, yeah, I'd like to give that a try for a day. Books and books have been written about how miserable people who are extremely wealthy really are. The American dream is, can become a nightmare if we're not careful. But our story, our stories are called to be redemption, redemption stories, and it begins with Jesus, the pioneer, the author, the founder of our faith. For, who, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The third subplot is that the best stories involve the main character overcoming their faults. Think, think of the movies that you watch again and again, or the stories that really you, you, you read or that, that, that hit you in, deep in here and, 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 and get you, you know, like, or maybe that YouTube video of, of that athlete who had to overcome all of these things and, and, and wasn't that great, but, but they just worked and worked and worked. Those kind of stories have power in them. When God's writing a story in our life, there's not one of us who comes to the story like we're going to be at the end of the story, right? There, 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 there's not one of us who can stand before God and say, look at how good and perfect I am already. You don't have to do anything with me. Now, we all come to Jesus with our faults. We all come to Jesus with our sins. He, he, he goes in verse 5 to say, excuse me, in verse 4, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Like, I was thinking about this, I was reading, and I was thinking about the, 
the journey we take in the, God writing his story in our lives. And, and I don't know about you, but I mean, it, you know, it's pretty easy sometimes to write the ways we miss the mark, right? Like every single morning, y'all pray for me at like 7, let's see what time is it, like 740. That's the time we've already got the kids fed and they are starting to play with each other. But they don't have their shoes on, their teeth aren't brushed, and they need to get in the truck. So daddy says like 20 times, get in the truck, get in the truck. Has anyone seen the SNL skit with uh, uh, Chris Farrell? He's, and he's cooking and he's like, get off the shed. No, okay, so go on, go, on the, go on the YouTube later and type in uh, uh, Will Farrell and get off the shed. And there's this skit where Will Ferrell is like cooking. He's just all pleasant and everything. And, the, and he's talking to a friend or a neighbor has come. And his, but his kids obviously are off playing. And he's just playing. He's like, get off the shed. And, you know, begins it like that. And by the end, he's just, he's cooking and having this pleasant conversation. But then he's just yelling as hard as he can at his kids to get off the shed. So, so just, a, just, a, just a peek into my mornings. Uh, about 740, I could, I could use your prayers for the kids to, to, to listen they listen so well until 7.40. And uh, couldn't, we make a, couldn't we make a list of like the things that we wish we could do over or that we need to work through or uh, you know, ways that, again, we, we miss the mark? Every story, every story that God is writing in our lives, those things are there. The best stories involve the main character overcoming their faults. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews says here, in your struggle against this, are you really struggling? Are you really, are you really trying to overcome this? Because you're not shedding blood yet. Anybody have a coach like that? Like, they can't do that nowadays or they get fired but like, and they get on the Internet. But, like, some of you had coaches, like, some of you old guys, like, way back in the day when, like, you did, like, three-a-day practices. And if you weren't having a heat stroke, you weren't doing it right, right? I mean, some of you had a little bit of brain damage from that. Your wives, that's why they're like that. I'm just joking, just joking, just joking. But y'all remember that? You can't do that. You can't practice like that nowadays. You can't do that. Global warming and everything, get, heating everything up. Don't, don't want anybody passing out and getting hurt on the field. But I kind of get that from, from, from right here. You have, you're not shedding your blood yet. Are you, really, are you really digging? Are you really trying to overcome these things? The best stories involve when the main character works and pushes through it. And overcoming faults, overcoming sin... In doing so, the main character always become more disciplined. There's an extended passage I'm going to read here, and it goes like this. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as, as, father, as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not, Ill then you are not legitimate. I'm sorry, y'all. I put up a deer stand yesterday afternoon with the kids, and I'm allergic to the woods. And I can't read when my eyes are watering. I'm going to go back to verse 8. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. You are not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we subject uh, to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our own good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces harvest, a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been tr trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. So I want to take a moment to just acknowledge that we live in a fallen world. And when we hear this, I've, read, I've taught this, this passage of Scripture with youth. And they've talked about parents who've disciplined them, that it's not been, it's been abuse. So I want to just recognize for a minute that we all kind of have some baggage there, a lot of us do, uh, of, of, of discipline. And so I want to kind of di divorce, if we could, from seeing, just divide these two, from seeing the discipline from a father and just go to the discipline of God. Di the discipline that God gives to us is always just. 
it is always holy. Yet some people bring into, into the relationship with God baggage that they have from, from, from relationships with mother and father, right? This, this is a reality that we see in the world. But if we, if we could look at God and see that sometimes the things that God brings to us, the Holy Spirit is leading us through, trying to help us be more disciplined. God is always fair. God is always just. He is always loving. He is always kind. And he is almost always gentle. That is who God is. And if for some reason we aren't experiencing that with God, when we say, well, God's being harsh with me, we need to be very careful and, 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 and look, at, look at it through the lens of Scripture and say, well, maybe we're not listen full, listening fully to the Spirit of God. Because God disciplines us as a loving parent. And it's a good thing. And discipline isn't, it's not pleasant, is it? It's not pleasant when our habits change. It's not pleasant when we put things away. But, but those things are so important as God is writing the story in our lives. And they leave us dis- different. Discipline leaves us different. It's, it's weird. Verse 12 it says, Therefore strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. What's that about? Sometimes as God is changing us, challenging us, and we're becoming more disciplined, it weakens us a little bit. We might stand before God and say, I feel, I feel a little less powerful. I, I feel a little feeble. I, my, my, my knees are a little weak. I feel drained. That's God saying, you, you need to find the, the power that I give you. you, you you're, you're feeling like that because you're, it's like you're in withdrawal from the other things that you've allowed to, to put your identity in. But as you become more disciplined and, and, and are seeking after me, there's a new strength you have, to, you have to discover. But God uses that process. He allows us to... To, to, to be stripped down and to feel weak and to feel feeble and to feel this, this need to, 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 to rebuild the muscles in our lives so that the muscles can be trained by Christ and to follow Him. And I, um, I, it, it, verse 13, excuse me, verse 14, he goes on and says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The journey towards Jesus always leads us into peace and holiness. It always leads us to peace and holiness. But sometimes there's some struggle to get there, right? Right? Sometimes there's a fire that we have to, to, to run through. Sometimes it's like running over those hot coals to get to the peace and the holiness. But that's always where it leads. Any of you ever tried to give up coffee? Yeah, I've tried it like five times. Those are like the worst mornings of my life. Like, really bad. Like, I gave up chicken one time for, like, or, like, all, all meat. I was a runner, so, so I, I was a, y'all remember I was a cyclist in college, and then I, I, I got done and got burned out and quit, and a few years later, I decided I wanted to be a runner, and I started running these 5K races, all right? And then I, I got my time under 20 minutes, and I got right down close to 19, and I was like, I need to get under, I want to get under 19, what can I do? And so I Googled it up, you know, what can, how can I get lighter, and then I can, it said, stop eating meat. So for like two months, I stopped eating meat. And I got weaker and weaker and weaker until one day after two months, I was driving by Zaxby's, y'all. And I pulled in the driveway and I said, Lord, forgive me. This running has nothing to do with you. I'm going to go and partake. I'm going to eat this chicken. And it was good. It was real good. But you know, when you try to make an adjustment or you try to go on a new diet or you try to do, you know, when you try to... to to, you know, to a, a heart healthy thing or ex, new exercise or whatever it is, it's not always easy, is it? Or that first day getting back, I know Chris Tomlin, our youth minister, uh, lifting weights, I'm sure he could talk all about that, you know, getting all swollen and everything. How, how hard, when you first hit back, and like two days later, you're like, you can't move. You know, it's, just, it's the same thing in our spiritual journey. When we're, when, when we're changing, and when we're following Jesus and when we're seeking peace and holiness and, and, and to be like him, this, this word, we use the word, the spiritual word, sanctification. You ever heard that? Sanctification. It begins when we put our faith in Jesus. Sanctification means to be made holy. It's a process that begins when we put our faith in Jesus and it ends when we die because then we are made perfect and put in, in the, the presence of God. But in the process, we're, we're, we're journeying along sanctification. We're journeying along towards God, toward holiness, to look more like 
Jesus. And y'all, there are things we overcome. There are things we have to struggle through. There, 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 there are things that are not easy. But God is always leading us to peace and holiness. And let me tell you, there are people, spiritual leaders, who are leading people in the name of Jesus away from peace and holiness. They're always in conflict with everyone around them. There's no peace and love. You don't see the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, kindness. We have to be very careful because there is an enemy. There is an enemy that hates God. We don't want to give him so much power. He, he can't overcome God. But in, in, in a person who, who puts God behind for other things, yeah, the devil's going to have a playground there. We've got to be careful. We have to be so careful because a person can be thinking that they are drawing so close to God let live, yet live such a godless life. We see over and over and over and over in the scriptures that God is, is leading us towards peace, reconciliation, redemption, holiness. We see that all over the place. It's undeniable to think that there's any other story that we're called to live. I, I read about all these people that were going through all that hard stuff right there. They were being extremely persecuted. But almost every single time, they turned the other cheek, didn't they? They chose to love people rather than hate people. That's the calling of God. That's the calling that we have to live into if we're going to live the lives, the stories that God is calling us to live, to look more like Jesus. Remember Peter grabbing that sword and cutting that soldier's ear off the night that they came to arrest Jesus? Jesus said, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. He was speaking truth about a lot of things in that moment. Peter was a person who was known for consistently being inconsistent. Anybody? I, I, can, I can feel like that relate to Peter sometimes, consistently being in, inconsistent. He, he, he was missing it. He missed it over and over, and then he'd get it a little bit, and then he'd miss it again. Then verse, I'm going to go ahead and end this. Let's get to the end, the finish line. Verse 15, the main character then has the call to lead other people to Jesus. Y'all remember a couple weeks ago I said Jesus plus nothing equals everything? Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Everything, main character, us in this story, the, our subplot, it, we are always called to lead other people toward Jesus. Verse 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I'm going to read it again. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. What does it mean to fall short of the grace of God? What's grace? Grace is a gift, right? It's the free gift. It's the, it's the free gift of, that, that, we've, that we've been given the opportunity to accept Jesus as our Savior. It's a free gift. You don't, you don't have to earn it. The only thing you have to do is accept it. The only thing you have to do is, is receive it and accept it. It's a free gift. But so many people want to come to Jesus and give them something. All he wants is our life. Not, not, the, not our works, just, just our love and our affection. And we don't, even, we, don't, we, don't even, we don't really have to give that. Because once we, once we receive it, that's all, that's all we want to do. We don't have to do it, we want to do it. Once we receive, fully receive the grace gift of God, and, it, and allow it to change us, the only, the only posture that we have is wanting to give honor, glory, praise to God, and to share that with the people around us. And so the writer of Hebrews says, Make, uh, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. See to it that no one comes to Jesus plus something else. Because Jesus plus nothing is everything. Let me ask you this morning as we close this time. Are you allowing God to write his story in your life? Are you allowing God to write his story in your life? Or are you too busy writing stories that aren't true? I think that there's a calling that many of us have to lay down the ghost stories and take up the God story. 
Amen. Amen. I want to remind you this morning that if God is moving in your life and, and you feel called to become a member of this church, or maybe uh, you, you haven't expressed faith in Christ before and you would like to do that and, and share that publicly and, and be baptized and in doing so become a member of this church, I just want to, to remind you that that invitation is always there and uh, that you can seek me out and you can call me during the week. We can get together and we can talk about that and I'll pray with you. If you want to hang around after the service, um, we can do that then as well. Uh, this morning we have um, a gentleman who is coming forward to, uh, to become a member of our church. He shared with me last week um, that he would like to do that this morning. So at this time I'd like to ask Gene to come forward. I'm standing here with Dr. Taylor Eugene Martin, but we know him, most of us do, as Gene. Gene uh, has previously served, and you're retired now, from Riverside Baptist Church. That is uh, Mary Hill, North Carolina. So a, a retired pastor being in the ranks doesn't, you, you don't make me nervous any while I'm, you know, well, preaching on Sunday mornings, you know. <laughs> not retired by choice. That's right. Well, you know, you, you, never, you never retire from you ministry, never retire do you? From preaching, no. you, sh you sure don't. So, um, but you've, ex you've expressed that you would like to become a member of this church family, and we are so glad that, that you feel called to do that, Gene. And um, as you know, when someone comes to become part of, of, of the church and become a member of the church, um, we make some promises. We, we make a covenant. Covenantal language is very important in the scriptures, and so uh, we, we are blessed to be able to do that this morning. And so, um, first, I'm going to, uh, to ask you uh, a, a few things, and if you agree to that, you will say, I will, okay? okay? As a member of this family of faith, will you support the mission and ministry of the First Baptist Church family with your presence, prayers, and service as the Holy Spirit grants you gifts to follow Jesus as his disciple? If so, please indicate by saying, I will. I will. And to the church, will you, members of First Baptist Church, pledge your support to Gene by offering your presence, prayers, and service to him as the Holy Spirit leads you? Will you promise to surround him with a community of love and grace that he may grow as a disciple of Christ and be found faithful in his service to others? And will you model authentic discipleship and offer Gene guidance and nurture while receiving guidance and nurture from him? If you agree to that, will you please say, I will? Oh, well, it's, it's official now, Gene. It's Welcome sure. to you. the First Baptist Church family. And um, I, I'm going to ask you all to stand now for our benediction. And as you're doing so, um, I know Gene would love to meet some of you. Oh, yeah. um, so he's going to hang out at the front here if you would like to come by and, and introduce yourself and welcome Gene uh, to our church family. And once again, uh, we look forward to this afternoon um, to the fall festival from 4 to 6 and then the trunk retreat from 6 to 8. And um, I do want to let you know if you're here around the property uh, driving in and out with trunks and doing that sort of stuff. Just be extra careful and, and extra mindful for little ones that are running around in, in costumes that, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're real safe with all that. So let us have a prayer. Father, again, we thank you for uh, the stories that you're, that you're calling us to, to write along with you, that, that, that you might write your redemption story and we might be wonderful subplots, beautiful stories in, in, in the main narrative of your salvation of humanity and, and the new heaven and earth that's going to come at the culmination one day. We thank you so much that we're called to be your people. We're called to be your sons and daughters. And may we be found faithful to our call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And may you go in peace.